<clears throat> Greetings and welcome. We are in uh, Senior AP English. And our objective for the hour is now to begin a series of observations on the great uh, German poet Goethe's Faust. Um, uh, you've already heard a lecture by Dr. Segru on Faust that's kind of cumulative in nature. Uh, and now let's talk uh, some specifics. What makes, what makes this a necessary poem? Well, I think there's a lot of ways to answer that. I mean, academics like Segru will argue it's good for your soul, he said. Uh, but that's kind of an esoteric answer, I think, as to why it is that you should read it. I mean, we made the same argument, for example, when we were reading Plato's Republic, right? I think there's a better answer, and I, and I, think, it's, I think it's evidenced in the opening lines of this poem. Let's make some general observations, and then we'll go to specifics. Faust, the poem, is the classic what's the point poem. Classic. If you've ever asked, really, what's the point? I mean, let's go ahead and do it now. Really, what's the point of doing all those stupid annotations? Really, what's the point of doing um, academic work in physics or chemistry? Really, what's the point of getting a job and making some kind of money at it? Really, what's the point of becoming famous and having people name buildings or towns after you after you're gone? Really, and you just go on. In fact, you find yourself pretty much asking about any experience in life, what's the point? Uh, that's that's going to be the essence of this poem, Faust. And in that regard, that's what makes it kind of a really famous poem. Um, let's talk about who Faust is. I'm with you now uh, on page 16, 17 of your volume. The very first time we meet Faust, okay, there's a couple of things we should point out about him. First of all, and since we're academics, we will appreciate this. First of all, he's an academic. He's a teacher, okay? He has spent his life in AP English, in AP Calculus, in AP Physics, in AP History. Got me? He has taken every PhD imaginable in every discipline, okay? So imagine it for a moment. You are gifted enough to qualify to attend Stanford or Harvard or Princeton. And when you arrive as a freshman, when you're asked, what is your major, you say, yes. And they say, no, no, we need to know what's your major. And you say it again, right, you got it. And they say, I'm sorry, you're clearly not understanding our question. What do you want to study at Stanford? And you say, you got it, that's right. I'm going to take PhDs, terminal degrees, in everything you teach at Stanford. I'm going to do every, every class in every discipline. No, you don't understand. You need to choose whether you're going to be an engineer, a physicist, or a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a poet. You need to kind of determine which one of these disciplines. And you say, you're not hearing me. I'm far more gifted than anybody who's ever attended this institution. I will be studying in every single discipline, and I'm going to receive uh, terminal degrees in every one. Well, the person looks at you with some incredulity and then starts giving you tests, and guess what? You really do have the academic intellectual capacity to study in all those areas. For example, you take an ACT and you write a perfect score. You take a GRE, you write a perfect score. You're able to already clip out of all of the different languages that Stanford will teach. You already know them all. You were studying them at a very young age. You are a prodigy, and you do. You study everything. For kicks and giggles, you sit down and read the World Book Encyclopedia Britannica. And you annotate it so that you can, for example, go on trivial pursuit games and that kind of thing. And you can kill anybody who asks you just silly trivia. You know dates in your mind immediately. You can call, you're a walking Google. Only you're better than Google because you can put ideas together that Google still can't do. Someday they probably will. Remember, Google, of course, invented it, Palo Alto, right? Okay. And there you are on that campus, you've done it. Let's just put your age at 50, got me? At 50 years old, you've done everything academically, intellectually imaginable, but I'm not done because you went to Stanford. You've also traveled. You've seen everything. 
right? So for example, you've seen all the major works of uh, you know, architecture. Of course, you've read histories of all those works. You know who, for example, constructed all of the different important cathedrals in the world. And then you went and visited. You've had all the experiences of eating all the different cuisine and the five-star restaurants in the world so that you know what real Chinese food tastes like. You know what a real pizza tastes like, et cetera, et cetera. You've done it all. You've swam in the Mediterranean Ocean. You've played in the Nile. And you've also spent some time in the Amazon. Okay, so you've done it all. You've seen everything. And now, at 50, you're Faust. Notice how he begins. Two observations right away, sounding very much like Shakespeare's Hamlet. We meet Faust for the first time alone in his office, in his study. If you were putting this on stage, you would have all of the representations of what it means to be an academic. You would have you know, 10,000 uh, really important old volumes of books sitting there. You would have a, your, um, you know, your lab kit right there because he's very interested in science and mathematics and chemistry. You would have all of the trappings that would make your study look like some kind of mad scientist's library. Okay. And there you are, sitting all by yourself, late into the night, and are you ready for this? You're writing. Not a paper that's going to be published. You're writing a note to yourself. Okay? Kind of journaling. And all of a sudden you pause and you look out to nothingness and you say the very first word. Alas. Now this is our word. It's an English word and we're going to see it when we see T.S. Eliot's love song, uh, um, um, Holloman. Uh, but let's define it. Alas is this right here. You ready for this? If one of your pals today, some of us are feeling this, if, if one of your pals today were to say when asked, how's it going, if he or she just went, <sighs> how would you qualify that? Would you have an adjective for that? <sighs> That's what alas means, by the way. That's what alas means. The, the opening line of this poem is, <sighs> I've taught a few seniors who with some 30 days of school remaining, Especially who have gone that academic track. Wait a minute. We kind of have done all of the stuff. Whatever hard classes there were that you could take in this place, we kind of took those classes. Oh, yeah. And we even did kind of well in them. So that now when people look at us, one thing they for sure know about us is that we kind of know what it means to do homework. We've done a little homework. Would you agree with me? I mean, oh, it's not like it's not like you it's not like you don't you haven't had the experience of doing a little homework. Would you agree? Take a look at what he says. Alas. <sighs> look at everything he's studied. I've studied philosophy, the law, and physics, what we would call biology. And also, more's the pity, divinity. I learned how to read in Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic so I can read the Bible in the original languages. I've studied all of the major theologians from St. Augustine to, as well, Thomas Aquinas. If you, can ask me, if you ask me any question about God, I can give you every argument for the existence of God in the original Latin of Thomas Aquinas. I've memorized it all. I know it all. Keep going. With ardent effort and through and through, and here I am about as wise today, poor fool, as I ever was. Put it in your own words. What's he say right away about, he knows everything, but he calls himself a fool. What an idiot, he says I am. I know everything, and the one thing I'm for sure that I know is just how stupid I am. What an idiot I am. Some, some students have pointed out, I'm not sure this is the best of poems to be reading right at the end of our high school career. After we've kind of done all of this little logic chopping, handing in all of our little assignments, getting all of our little A's so we could fill out and get stars on our little chart so that we can walk across some track and, you know, and, and, and receive our 10 minutes of accolades after all of the hard work. It is a fair question to ask, really? To speak in eighth grade language, Really? It really mattered that much to you that you were able to accomplish this? Really? That's where Faust is. 
And now he's looking back going, really? What did I, like, what have I done with my life? We're only six lines in to this really long poem. For those of you who would all resonate with this to the degree that you say, okay, so speaking of hyperbole and speaking of bizarre paradoxes, why don't we all just shut our volumes up now and just leave it? And one or two readers have pointed out, I, I think I want to hear what he has to say next. All of a sudden, Faust has you. If you're an academic reading this, you immediately begin to identify. You know, you could have gone a different track. It's true. You would have gotten the same credits at high school for going a different track. All of the time, all of the energy you've given to it. Really? Why? Faust keeps going. My title is master, doctor even. And up the hill and down again, nearly 10 years, wherever I please, I've led my pupils by the nose. It's one of Mr. Tonkovich's favorite word pictures. What is it that he says he loves to do with his students? Grab them by the nose and lead them around everywhere it is they have to go. For 10 years now, he's been the master and doctor of everything. And he's been the teacher. And everyone kind of comes to him and says, Tell us the truth about all of this. And he's been doing it for some time, leading his students around by the nose. And see what we can know is, colon, not. Now, it's a kind of arcane language. And, and the, our poet, our translator here is trying to capture some of uh, Goethe's great poetry. What exactly does the word not mean for you? Yeah, Sin says it. Absolutely nothing. Now, it is very difficult for high school seniors in an AP English class to read these lines because it's almost as if Guter is asking you a simple question. Okay, all the stuff you've done for four years, if you want to count it all, it's 12 years. Some of us even starting before that because, of course, we had motivated parents that needed us to get into the right school. So we were doing school long before we hit kindergarten. Let's just call it 12 years. For 12 years, you've been doing this thing called school and you've done it. Hurrah, you're about ready to get out. Of course, the nasty irony is that for most of us, we're going to turn around and start it all over again. Let me get this straight. The one thing that you are so excited to get out of, you're now going to turn around and go right back into, and you're going to give me some yeah, but about why it's going to make sense the second time. But you're sitting at the end of a high school career going, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm beginning to kind of wonder what all this was about. And one or two seniors at this point will say, this sounds very familiar to what conversations I've been having with people in my life right about now as I began to become more self-reflective. As one senior said, I didn't have time to think about what I was doing through high school. I was too busy doing it. I mean, I didn't have time to talk about how stupid the assignments were. I had to get A's on the assignments, so I just did them. Now all of a sudden, I'm at the end of it, and I'm like, what did I gain from all of that other than a lot of lost energy and headaches? It might have fatigued me physically, emotionally, even spiritually, but that's all kind of negative stuff. What's the positive stuff? What was the point of all of this other than to prove I can endure large amounts of pain? Prove to who and prove for what? I mean, at least if you're a ball player, you get to win some trophy or something. And of course, those of us who know anything about that recognize that's kind of silly too. But at least you get a little trophy. What do you get for an academic? People look at you and go, really? That's what you gave all your time and energy to. Trying to memorize poems. Trying to figure out mathematics problems. <laughs> really? That's what you gave your energy to? Think of what you could. Dude, you could have been having fun. Do you see kind of buried right behind Faust's observation? is the <sighs> of the opening line. Ah, our French word here is ennui. E-N-U, E-N-N-U-I, ennui. It's the French word which means what? Does anyone know what the word means? Does anyone know this word? Ennui means boredom. 
It means a dark, depressed boredom. It means having nothing to do. Are you ready for this? It means having nothing to do because you've done it all already. He's like, once you've pretty much taken every class at Stanford, what would be the point of learning more stuff? Right? Once you can solve all the math problems in the calculus book, what's the challenge of calculus? Once you can do all of the physics, what's the point? Right? Now, for those of you that say, oh, there's always another problem, Faust is not you. Faust has already done all the problems. He already understands everything. He gets it all. And now his question is, really? I told you, that's the, really? What's the point? It's ironic that one or two of my students have said, this may be the most important stuff we've read in our entire high school career. And it's really darkly ironic that we're reading it now. Keep reading. He says, when I knew this, it seared my heart. What does that mean? Don't confuse what he's saying. What does the word sear mean? If you sear something, you do what? You burn it, right? You burn it. In other words, he says, I worked, worked, worked like a little, little beaver, working, 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 working. And then all of a sudden, I did all this work, 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 work. And now he says, I turn around and it's like, really? And it's in that moment of really realizing that question, really? He said, it totally torqued me off. It made me so unbelievably mad. Like somehow he had been fooled. You know what I mean? Like someone you trust has told you, you got to do all this stuff. You got to do all this stuff. You got to do all this stuff. And so he does it. Okay. And now all of a sudden it's like he's bought into it. And now he's asking a, a simple question. What is the point of all the learning? What's the point of learning all the time? What's the point of the homework? True. Okay, here we go. Some of you are going to say, hey, 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 there's a reason why I did all that math. True. I know more than all the dimwits. So that's true. I can take an ACT and I can write a higher score in math and therefore I know more than stupid people who can't do the math. But what's the real question buried behind this observation? What's the real question he's asking? So I'm smarter than dimwits, but what? So what? So what? I mean, really? Am I that better off than a dimwit? He already has called himself a dimwit. What's he called himself? A fool. I mean, he's already said, I'm an idiot. But then he goes, well, at least I'm smarter than other idiots. The doctors, masters, clerks, and prelates. I'm not tormented by doubt and scruple. I'm not afraid of hell and the devil. But all my joy has left me, too. I know that it's nothing good I know. It's an interesting line. I know that what I teach won't mend the minds and the manners of humankind. I've neither goods nor gold and neither honor in the world nor any splendor. A dog wouldn't live like this. So he says, I've given myself to necromancy. That is to say, casting spells. And all of a sudden, who shows up but Mephistopheles. Now, this is the second time we've seen the devil in a poem where he's given primary lead role. What was the other poem at 3A? It, w it was Milton's Paradise Lost, you bet. And of course, Guta loves Milton's attempts in Paradise Lost. Oh yeah, Milton, a cat who knew everything, right? He metaphorically speaking took all the PhDs that Stanford had to offer, right? And then he sat down to write Paradise Lost. Goethe sits down to write Faust and he begins by saying, really? What is the point? Tomorrow when we come back we'll address Faust's answer and Goethe's answer. Thank you.